Thank you, Brother Scott. And boy, is that needed today in our world, is uh, the share of the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Valentine's Day. Y'all happy about that? It's also my anniversary, so happy 24th anniversary to my amazing wife. And let me just share this. I did that with the intentions of buying just one gift. It didn't work. There's an anniversary gift and a Valentine's gift, so I thought I was smarter than that 24 years ago, but obviously I'm not. So no, she actually doesn't expect two gifts, and she got the best gift when she married me, so I mean... <laughs> Um, I need a praise team to come back up so we can close and, and give the altar a call. So um, uh, I'm going to do start a new series next week simply titled Blessed. And um, anybody blessed today? Listen, if you're saved, you're blessed. Amen. And, um, but I want to talk about blessed not in the sense of as we think about materialistic blessings, but those heavenly blessings, those spiritual blessings that we enjoy as believers in Christ. So don't miss next week, um, like I said, probably about six weeks of a series called Simply Total Blessed, and, and um, I'm excited about it, and I hope you are as well. Um, let me just tell you about Easter Sunday, just for a couple minutes before I get into it. You can turn to 1 Corinthians 13, by the way, um, while I'm doing this. Um, we are going to have two services on Easter Sunday. We're going to have a 9 o'clock service and an 11 o'clock service, and so um, we're excited about this. Um, Easter Sunday is always uh, probably the most attended service of our year. It is the most attended service. And so we just feel like, again, to to just be safe, this, that, and the other. We're going to have two services at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Um, so the 9 o'clock service will probably be better um, for this simple reason. I'll be on a time sh constriction. So if you want to get out and go have your dinner, you, 9 o'clock is probably going to be the service for you. 11 o'clock, I'm not restricted by time so we could be here till Monday I'm just kidding I'm, I'm kidding don't think that it'll be the same services same message same music and this that and the other so nothing to be different so nine o'clock and eleven o'clock on Easter Sunday um, it's the first Sunday in April this year so um, make your plans um, bring your family with you as well so um, I'm excited about that I'm excited about Easter anybody else excited about Easter because again we we get to celebrate our risen Savior Jesus Christ amen and, uh, but I'm thankful today that we don't have to wait till Easter Sunday to celebrate him. We can celebrate him today. So, uh, but today I'm going to just talk about uh, the greatest of these is love. That's the title of my sermon this morning. The greatest of these is love. And so when we think about the word love, um, again, I, I think it just gets misinterpreted, especially in our world today. And I'm just going to, this is audience participation this morning, okay? You ready? When you hear the word love, what are some things you think of? Kids. <laughs> Kids and then sacrifice. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, that's my demented mind just racing. The first two words were kids and sacrifice. Sorry for those who are watching. We're normally not like this. We don't sacrifice kids here, I promise. <laughs> parents are now going over to the nursery to get their kids we're out of here guys sacrifice would be a great word when i think about the word love what else guys when you think about the word love what are what are some some words that come to mind commitment family god he is love he took half my sermon but that's okay happiness joy and those are all great words as we think about the word love and but when you think about the world's definition of love and what culture teaches of of what love is what are some things that come to mind when you think of what does the world say about love what love is possessions desires appearance i heard a word over here gratification what they can get from you i've seen it guys I've, I've seen, uh, listen, I've done counseling, I've, uh, I've done even marriage counseling that, that, again, the biggest issue that they have in their marriage is, again, they're, they're, they're basing their love on what they can do for one another. You know, you, you love me when you do this. You show your love for me when you do this. Or if you did love me, you would, you fill in the blank. 
Is anybody thankful this morning that God's love is not based on what we do for him? He loves us unconditionally. And by the way, I am thankful this morning for Romans chapter number 5 that he loves me in spite of the fact that I'm a sinner. Any sinners in here this morning? Hold on, Pastor. Wait a minute. You're talking about love and you call me a sinner. We're sinners. But, but the beauty of that, guys, is in spite of that, God still loves us. And when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, and, and again, many people will use this in weddings. And by the way, in the context, it's not a wedding chapter. Now, we call 1 Corinthians 13 the great love chapter. Hebrews 11 is the great faith chapter. So we come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And, and listen to what the Apostle Paul says. I'm going to read just the first four verses because here's what I want you to get today. Here's your outline. The importance of love, what love is, and what love is not. And I think Paul sums all of this up in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. He lets us know what the importance of love is. He lets us know what love is. And he also lets us know what love is not. Verse number one. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am noisy, gong, clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Then verse 4, love is patient, kind, does not envy or boast, not arrogant or rude, doesn't insist on its own, not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, they will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but now face to face. I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Then verse 13, church. For now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Love. And, and again, 1 Corinthians 13, guys, uh, when, we, when we talk about love, and by the way, I'm so thankful this morning, there's absolutely no end to knowing God and the love that he has for us. We can know that God loves us. Isn't that good? To know that, that, that there's a God in heaven that, that in spite of us, in, in spite of us being unholy and unrighteous and ungodly, and he still loves us. And again, when we talk about love and in this context that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 13, again, he's dealing with the issue of, of spiritual gifts from, from chapter number 12. Chapter number 12, we see the issue of spiritual gifts. Now, let me just say this, guys, in, up, up, right up front. The Apostle Paul never condemned spiritual gifts. He never says that you shouldn't have them. Matter of fact, he says the complete opposite of it. He never says doctrine is bad. How many believe doctrine is needed? How many believe spiritual gifts are needed? But here's what he is saying, guys. You can have the greatest gifts on this planet. You can have all the right doctrine. You can know the Word of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. But without love, you are what? Nothing. It's just a lot of noise. A lot of meaningless noise, by the way. Do you think... Paul is stressing that love is important? Do you think Jesus stressed the importance of love? He summed it all up. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. And then he adds to that. To do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. As Scott talked about in his intro to his song, guys, I think what we're seeing in, in society today is it's becoming harder and harder and harder to love your neighbor. Shouldn't be for children of God. Because again, we know that God loves us, and because God loves us, we are to demonstrate or we are to show that love to our neighbor. Turn to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor right now and say, I love you. guys let me let me say this and, and please hear me that's the three most powerful words you can ever say from your mouth 
the three most powerful words you can say. And again, when we, when we, t- when we show people that we love them and, and, and we demonstrate it and we live it in front of them, we're not just, it's not just lip service, but we're showing it. Jesus said, if you love me, what will you do? Keep my commandments. Now again, does he say that, listen, all 613 commandments that are in the word of God, that listen, unless you're keeping them every single day of your life, you're not demonstrating, you're not proving your love for me? No. It's not necessarily the keeping of the commandments, guys. It's our obedience to him that demonstrates our love for him. I show and demonstrate my love for God by obeying what he has called me and asked me to do. And the two greatest things that he's asked me to do is love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love my neighbors myself. Guys, that's the two greatest things that we can do in culture today, in society today. And guys, again, we use this, the excuses and we come up with reasoning and, and we talk ourselves out of loving people and this, that, and the other, right? Well, I can't love them because they don't vote the same way I do or I can't love them because they're not the same denomination I'm in or I can't love them because they don't go to church and I can't love them because, guys, we, we use all the, all the reasons in the world to not love somebody. Listen to me. You ready? Before you got saved, hear me out, you were unlovable. Right? But aren't you thankful that God loved you anyways? And not only did he love you, but he he showed his love, he proved his love by, by giving his life on the cross. He demonstrated, he said, listen, if there's any doubt of how much I love you, I'm going to show you and remove all doubt. I'm going to lay my life down for you. And he didn't put stipulations on it. All he said is, listen, you just have to believe by faith that I'm showing you how much I love you by giving my life for you. And so Paul talks about how important love is. It's separate and superior to anything that we can do or anything that we can say. Paul says, listen, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, listen, Paul's saying, listen, I can be the most dynamic preacher. I can wax eloquently from this pulpit. I can have all these great gifts. I, I can, I, I, listen, I can be the greatest theologian on the planet. But without love. But without love. Guys, I've heard a lot of mean-spirited sermons in my life. I've even preached one that was definitely not from God. It was all in the flesh because I had to prove a point. Right? And and again, when somebody does us wrong, we want to prove a point. When you study the fruit of the Spirit, guys, what is the first characteristic listed in the fruit of the Spirit? Love. (laughs) Why do you think that is, guys? Because when you are showing love, guys, everything else falls into place. Joy, peace, long-suffering. You think you'll be a little bit more long-suffering if you love somebody? A little bit more patient with them? Do you you think you'll have a little bit more joy when when there's love in your heart? Temperance. Do you think, again, there would be more, a little bit more self-control when there's love, when you're demonstrating love? And guys, again, when we, when we talk about faith and when we talk about hope, and, and listen, Paul even said, listen, one day, again, prophecies will end and tongues will cease and knowledge will pass away. But you know that something that will never end, church? Love. Hear me out, guys. Faith, hope, and love, right? Do you still need faith when you're in heaven? No, because your faith becomes sight, right? You no longer need faith. Do you need hope any longer when you're in heaven? No, church, but guess what will endure forever and ever? Love. You know why it endures forever and ever? 1 John 4 says, because God himself is love. 
And guys, the greatest character trait that we as children of God, if we want to be like our Savior Jesus Christ, the greatest characteristic trait that we can show to a lost and dying world is the fact that God loves us and we love them as well. Jesus Christ himself was criticized for sitting with sinners and publicans. But can I remind you this morning, he sat with them, he didn't sin with them. He sat with them, why? He sat with them because he loved them. And again, he wanted them to know that they were loved by him. And he wanted them to know that, you know what, listen, here's why I'm coming. To seek and to save that which is lost. I'm going to ask you what I asked our Sunday school class this morning. Can anybody this morning understand God's love for us? Can we comprehend it? Guys, I love my wife and I love my kids more than life itself. But then when I think about how much I love them, and I'm always in comparison, I'm like, how much does God love me? If, if, listen, if I love my wife and, and kids this much, even when they drive me nuts, does anybody else in this room drive God nuts? Three of you, you liars. We all do it, guys. You know why? Because, again, we still wrestle with this flesh and this, this sinful nature that we have. But, again, Paul is stressing how important it is to love others. Again, is, is all these gifts great and needed to be had in the church? Absolutely. Does anybody know what your spiritual gift is? you know what your spiritual gift is? If we use these gifts without love, how effective do you think it will be? not effective at all yeah they may listen to you they may think man you're a great communicator you're i mean you're awesome but then if you're not demonstrating love to them guys they'll pick it up pretty quick again about about us loving them first three we can sell and give everything that we have give to the poor but again if you're doing it with the wrong motive if you're doing it out of obligation maybe or you're doing it Without love, it profits nothing. We can give up our bodies to be burned. Listen, guys, we can become martyrs for Jesus, but without love. See, how can you do that? The Muslims do it every day. Because, again, they think they're gaining favor with their God. Because it's, it's not a salvation issue, guys. It's a love issue. Paul's addressing the church. And again, the, 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 when, when you think about the, the spiritual gifts, by the way, guys, they had it. <laughs> the church of Corinth knew the spiritual gifts, and they, they, they knew doctrine. But everything was being done with wrong motives, wrong attitudes. It wasn't being done in love. So that's the importance of love. Then the second thing I want you to see is what love is. And of course, I've got to be honest with you. When, I've, when I'm preparing this week and I wrote the words, what love is, of course, that song came to my mind. I want to know what love is. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I want you to show. I'm not going to sing it. But some of you got it going through your mind now. You got it, it's in your spirit and you got to get it out of you right now. But, but look at verse number four with me again. Look what he says love is, guys. And again, I think most of us struggle with, with many of these, but, but I'm hoping and praying today that as we, as we go through these, that, that, again, we start to work on them. Love is patient, kind, doesn't envy or boast, not arrogant or rude, doesn't insist on its own, is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So again, let's look at this list. It's patient, it's kind, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Any impatient people in this room today? All right. We're, we're going to work on some love today, amen? Love is patient. What is Paul saying about the word patient? Again, it's lo the, the, the literal meaning of the word patient in this text is long-tempered. The characteristic of love reveals the truth that does not retaliate. Yeah. How many times has something been done bad to you and your first motive is to do what? 
to retaliate. Guys, Paul is saying, listen, here's what love is. It's patient. It controls itself in order to win the person and to help them to live, work, and serve as he should. The church was starting to become impatient with one another. So Paul's addressing it. He's bringing them back in and saying, you know what, guys? Here's what love is. It's patient. <laughs> Listen, we can become even impatient in our marriages. Anybody been there? Pastor, I'm there now. We, we're just impatient people. What are you saying, guys? Listen, love is patient. Then also, love is kind. Now, listen, genuine love is never hateful or mean. It respects others and reaches out to them. It's courteous. It's good. It's helpful. It's, 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 it's helping, them, helping others as well, guys. Now, let me just say this about, about love. Love in this context, guys, is always directed towards people, not circumstances. We, we love people, not necessarily the, the acts or the circumstances that they're in or even the sin that they're living. We should never love sin as believers, guys, ever, whether it's our own sin or whether it's somebody else sinning. But again, we, we, it's the way that we respond to it. That's either going to win them for Christ or to push them further into a sinful life. Which would we rather do as a church? I'd rather win them for Christ. Because again, I know that they're living in this sin. I know that they're, they're living the way that they're living, number one, because they don't have a right relationship with God. And the only way they can have this right relationship with God is to have a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. So again, we have to be kind. Ephesians 4.32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things. Now again, it stands up under the weight and, and the onslaught of all things, and it covers up the faults of others. Listen to this, church. It has no pleasure in exposing the wrong and weaknesses of others. Here's what I mean by that, guys. You see that your brother or sister has an issue. You're not making it public. What you're doing is you're demonstrating love for that person by ministering to them, reaching out to them, and helping them instead of exposing what they're battling, going to them because you know what they're facing and what they're battling, loving them in spite of it and trying to help them through it. Again, let's go back to love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. How many, comm how many, how many original commandments do we have? Oh, good grief. Going back to Bible 101 here. Ten. Ten commandments. The first four have to do with man's responsibility to God. The last six have to do with man's responsibility to one another. Let me just say this. How much easier or how much better would this world be if we, li we looked at those ten commandments, we started to live them and obey them, Right? And again, Jesus said, listen, we can sum all this up, all the law up in one, just one simple word. And what is that one simple word? Love. Because again, how much murder would there be if you loved one another? How much lying would there be? How much stealing would there be? How much honoring of mother, mother and father would there be? There'd be all kind of honoring mother and father. How much coveting would there be? But guys, through all that, it takes us being patient and kind and, and, and bearing all things and, and believing all things and bearing all things. Bearing all things. Again, standing up, not exposing the wrong. Believes all things, completely trusting, always eager to believe the best. Love trusts, it believes, and love has confidence in the one loved. hopes all things, expects the good to eventually become victorious. Here's what hope does, guys. It absolutely refuses failure. And here's what I mean by that as well, guys. If you haven't already failed in life, it's coming. Because we're all going to fail. 
when a brother or sister in Christ fails at whatever it is that they're doing, guys, using their spiritual gifts or what have you, guys, does that mean that we quit loving them? No. Do you quit loving your pastor when, you, when he fails you? No. Some of you are struggling with answering that. Do I quit loving you when you fail? No. But guys, again, the, 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 the reality is this, guys. Every person, 100% of us, either now or sometime in the near future, are going to fail. We're going to fail God. We're going to fail one another. But again, it should not remove how much that we love one another. It hopes. It believes all things. It endures all things. Guys, and this is, to me, this is one of the most important ones. Again, by the way, it's, an, it's a military term. Love does not give up the fort. <laughs> Please hear me out this morning, guys. Marriages fail because they give up. You know, I've heard people say, you know, I just don't love them anymore. I, I've fallen out of love. Number one, I, I still don't understand that term. So if anybody's got the answer to that, please let me know. I don't know how you fall out of love. I'm just being honest. But guys, marriages fail because of this very reason right here, guys. We give up. You know why churches fail? Because we give up. We stop loving one another. And again, you know why we stop loving one another? It's because we've lost our love for God. Remember Revelation, again, the seven churches? Again, the seven churches were doing some good stuff, right? There was one particular church that Jesus addressed. I have somewhat against you. Why? Because you've left your first love. The first love wasn't ministry. The first love wasn't spiritual gifts. The first love wasn't, again, what we can do in church. Guys, their first love was the love that they had for Jesus. Anybody remember the day you got saved? Anybody remember how much you loved Jesus Christ because of what he did for you? Guys, our love for Jesus should be stronger today than it was the day we got saved. And because of that, it should be easy for us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ to look past the faults of one another and love one another. Not love your sin, but love you. And because we love you, we bring correction to you for your sin. Guys, some of the greatest moments in my life as in ministry, guys, is when, when believers in Christ have come to me, and again, because they've had either an issue with me or I said something I shouldn't have said that offended them or upset them, and again, we handled it, we dealt with it. And can I tell you this, guys? I knew that they loved me when they came to me because they didn't come to my office and kick the door down and I've got a problem with you, Pastor. Because number one, if you ever do that to me, I'm just going to say, hold on a second. I need you to go out in the hallway and pray for a second. And I need money for a new door now. And come back in and let's talk about it. Isn't that the way believers should be with one another? But you know why we're not? Because we're impatient. We're not kind. We, we, and we're going to get to this in just a minute, what love is not. We don't want to bear all things. We don't want to endure. We just want to quit. We want to give up. Guys, I've seen so many people just quit church. Why? Because somebody upset them in the church. So they just quit. They gave up. Instead of trying to fix the problem. So that's what love is. And by the way, do you think Jesus represents every one of those things of what love is? Anybody thankful Jesus is patient? <laughs> Nobody? Anybody thankful that Jesus is kind? That he bears all things and hopes all things, believes all things, and, and he doesn't give up? Even when he's in the garden and he's praying to his father, you know, if it'd be possible, let this cup pass. He never gave up. He kept going to the cross. That's what love is. So what is love, what love is not? Now, Number one, it's not jealous. <laughs> I'm going to ask Kyle to stand up for a minute. Kyle, what's your spiritual gift? 
just the top one teaching I don't think anybody in this church if you've heard Kyle speak would doubt that his spiritual gift is not teaching dynamic communicator of the word of God I'm not jealous over the fact that he is a great teacher that's not my spiritual gift it's one of them it's it's a top two or three my spiritual gift is pastoring and evangelism that's that's my top two I'm not jealous over the fact that that he's a better teacher than I am I'm not I'm not upset that Mark Blair is a better teacher than I am especially in math but I'm talking about spiritually here guys I'm not jealous over anybody in this praise team that can sing better than me or play an instrument better than me but you know what they were battling with in the church at Corinth again I want their gift or I want this gift you know what listen God's given you the gift and it's not up to you to say well I want Kyle's gift that may not be what your gift is it may not be what God's plan and purpose is for you at First Baptist Church of Trenton I'm thankful this morning not everybody in this room has the spiritual gift of teaching because you know how much we would get accomplished here nothing I'm thankful that you have different gifts, gifts differing from one another. I'm thankful there's people in this church that have greater faith than I do. I'm thankful for that church. I'm not jealous of it. But again, that's what love is not. It's not jealous. Now let me just, let me bring it into the, to the marriage realm. How many of you husbands would agree with this statement? Your wife is better in you than you at a lot of stuff. Four husbands are you're good today the rest of you are in trouble I'm thankful that my wife's got gifts that I do not have and by the way vice versa how many of you wives are thankful that your wife or your, your wife <laughs> y'all think it's easy up here <sighs> I'm looking out at your face and getting all serious with me and I'm how many of you wives are thankful that your husbands have gifts that are better than yours? They can do things better than you. You know why? Because we're not jealous. We're thankful for that stuff. And Paul's reminding them, you know what, listen, in, instead of being jealous of, of the gifts that one another has, won't you be thankful that everybody's got gifts that are differing, but yet we're still one body? So again, love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. It doesn't vaunt itself. It doesn't brag. It doesn't seek recognition. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't want honor or applause from others. Here's what Paul's saying. Let me ask you, let me just say a serious question here, guys. How would you all respond if Pastor Kyle walked in here next Sunday with his chest pumped out and said, yeah, got the spiritual gift of teaching. How, so seriously yeah you're fired <laughs> but seriously what would you think of him if he did that arrogant proud boastful listen it's all about him he's wanting others to look at him and applaud him and pat him on his back right guys that's not what love is it doesn't boast about its own gifts and doesn't boast about anything else in its own life now, I would fire him on the spot. <laughs> Pat, Kyle, you got to go, man. <laughs> in love, that's right. <laughs> fire him in love. Brother, listen, I love you, but you got to go. <laughs> Coming here with that stuff. I just pulled my hamstring, by the way. <laughs> it's, it, it's, guys, it's, it's not jealous. It's not boastful. It doesn't, again, it doesn't vaunt itself. It's not prideful. It's not puffed up, arrogant, conceited. It doesn't think or act as though oneself is better or above others. But again, you know what the church was struggling with? Well, I'm better than, I'm better than, because listen, I've got this great gift. And you know, all, you just got the gift of faith. You know, my gift's a little bit more important than yours. No. Again, Paul addressed that. Every gift in the church is important for the health of the church no matter how significant you think it is. Love doesn't walk around with the big head. 
After I fired Kyle, I mean, we'd have to open the doors up, both doors back there to get his head through there. Right? It's not rude. It doesn't behave itself unseemly. It behaves and treats all people with respect and honor. And, and again, the respect that they desire to have in their own life is the same respect and honor that they want to display to others. Guys, man, anybody know any rude people? I didn't want you to raise your hand, but since you got your hand raised. <laughs> Guys, we all know those rude people. And, and again, when you're in their presence for just 30 seconds, you're looking for a way to get out, aren't you? And can somebody call my phone right now or just text me or something or lightning strike right next to the person? Don't hit the person. Strike right next to them to shake them up a little bit. Guys, that's not what love is, guys. It's, it's not rude. Again, it all, they all fit together, guys, with p proud and, and arrogant. And it's not selfish. It doesn't seek its own. It doesn't insist upon its own rights, which happens a lot in marriage, which happens a lot in our churches. I, we had, I had this discussion this week, and again, we were talking about people's desires for church and preferences for church and this, that, and the other for church. And, and I think one of my boys even asked me, you know, well, you're the pastor, man. I mean, basically... If you want something done, that's not the way it works, guys. Listen, I have my desires and, and wants and this, that, and the other guys, but you know what? Sometimes they're selfish. Because, again, I'm thinking of self-gratification instead of what is best for the entire body. And so, again, when you're talking about the spiritual gifts, uh, what happens is, guys, is that, again, we, we, we're not focused on anybody else's gift. Without me, without the gift that I have, Church fall apart, right? Isn't that the way we think sometimes, though? But again, guys, when we're, when we're talking about selfish, and, and again, we're, we're always looking on other people's needs. Philippians 2, 4, Paul says, let not, every, let, let not man think of his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus about others? Always. And listen to me, guys. If Jesus was about others, what should we as his children be about? Others. Even when it comes to spiritual gifts, guys, listen. When we decide, when we understand what our spiritual gift is and we're using it for the glory of God and we're impacting our communities and our homes and our churches, guys, we should have great rejoicing in that. Not be selfish over it. Not be selfish over the fact that he's got this gift and she's got this gift and he's got this gift and I've got this gift. But guys, and not just that, guys, but we're using that gift to meet the needs of others because why do we have the spiritual gifts? Why did God give us the gifts? To have used them in the church. Not to keep them for ourselves, and, but to use them. So love is not selfish. Love is also thinks no evil doesn't consider the wrong that's been against them it's not resentful doesn't hold a grudge it suffers the evil that's done to them that's not easy is it someone want to tell me who wrote first and second corinthians do you know everything paul went through and for paul to write this and and say, you know what, don't be resentful and don't hold grudges against somebody. Church, let me just say this, outside of Jesus, if there was anybody that's ever walked this planet that had the right to hold a grudge and be resentful, it was the Apostle Paul. But he never did. As a matter of fact, man, he counted it a joy that, man, I'm even worthy to suffer for Christ. Anybody said that lately? Oh, because we haven't suffered for Christ. It's funny, I had a pastor the Thursday night, he came to the funeral, and, and, um, <laughs> and I kind of, I hated to chuckle, but I, but I did. And he was, talking, he was telling me a story about when he knocked on the door one day, and, and he said this, this, this lady answered the door, and man, she cussed him up one side and down the other, and, and he was just talking about how he, he, was, he was persecuted that day. And <laughs> like I said, I, I kind of chuckled. I'm like, getting cussed at is being persecuted. Man, I, I, I get cursed, persecuted by my wife every day. 
I was waiting to see if she was going to catch it. Yeah, that's right. I got no more limit. It's Valentine's Day. But guys, again, that's, that's not what Paul is wanting us to understand, guys. He's wanting us, again, when evil is done against us, and again, we're, we're told in the, in the Word of God, you don't render evil with evil. You render evil with what? With good. That's not always easy. But guys, when, when, the, when the love of Christ constrains us, when the love of Christ is in us, you know what you will do? You won't be resentful. You won't hold a grudge. You won't want bad to happen to that person. As a matter of fact, you'll want good to happen to that person. Anybody thankful Jesus didn't hold a grudge against us? <laughs> he didn't say, well, you can't be saved because you did this to me. Oh, listen, I, I can't have fellowship with you right now because you did this to me, and I can't do this for you because you did Listen, I can't love you right now because this is what you're doing to me. No, he still loved us. Doesn't rejoice in sin. And guys, let me, and, and, I'll, and I'll be done here. Unrighteousness, evil, wrongdoing, love does not take pleasure in the unrighteousness and sin of others. And it doesn't do that because, number one, it doesn't take that pleasure in itself. Guys, I've said this a million times from this pulpit, and I'll say it another million times until Jesus comes back. Sin should break the hearts of God's people. Personal sin as well as corporate sin. When you see a brother or sister that's overtaken in a fault, that's living a life of sin, when you show, when you prove that you love them, when you want to let them know that you love them, you know what you'll do? You'll go to them and correct them in the right way. Because you have this strong desire. Because again, guys, aren't you thankful Jesus does the same thing? Aren't you thankful that his rod and his staff, they comfort us and they guide us? That when we start to get off a path that we shouldn't be on, what does he do? He grabs that, that staff and what does, he, what does he do, guys? Because he loves us. And when we see a brother overtaken in a fall, when we see them living a life of sin, to show them that we love them and care deeply about them, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to them. Guys, I hate sin. I hate it. Because I know the devastating effects that it has on humanity. And it's still happening today. It doesn't, love does not rejoice in evil. But it rejoices in the truth. Aren't you thankful Jesus said, therefore you shall know the truth. And what does truth do, church? sets us free sets us free guys again it doesn't rejoice in the wrongdoing but it rejoices in the truth and again do you think it broke Paul's heart to see not just Corinth but churches the church of Galatia and Ephesus and, and just to see how they've just started to get away from God and then he would come back and address them why not because he wanted to prove that he was this great apostle or that he was this dynamic speaker or that, listen, he can wax eloquent. He's, he can speak with the tongues of angels. No, Paul loved the church. And he loved the church because he loved the person who died for the church. And his name is Jesus Christ. And it drove Paul. It motivated Paul. And guys, that's exactly what should be the motivating factor in our lives is the love of God that he has for us and the love that we have for one another. In eternity, again, we'll no longer need faith because our faith will become sight. Love will continue because we know that God is love. 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves, he that loves not, knows not God, but God is love. Look at the first verse, the first two words of chapter 14. What do those two words say, church? Follow what? After what? Charity. Three words, sorry. I told you my math's not good. 
Mr. Blair, see me after service. I need some help. Follow after what again, church? Did you notice he doesn't say works? Follow after spiritual gifts. Follow after right doctrine. Follow after what church to belong to. Follow after anything else. He says, follow after love. You know why I believe he said that, church? Because when you pursue love, when you follow after love, right doctrine will fall into place. When you follow after love, you'll want to know what your spiritual gift is and use it for the glory of God. When you follow after love, you'll, you'll love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you'll love your neighbor as yourself. When you follow after love, guys, you'll desire to become more and more like the one who is love. God himself the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is this do we love one another you see guys it's love that enables us to understand to use our, our gifts for the glory of God it's love that helps us to understand God's love for us and God's love for people for God so loved the world the most famous verse in the Bible John three sixteen. for God so loved the world aren't you glad it didn't stop there because we would all be messed up right now. Okay, how did, how's, he, how's he show he loves us? He loves the world, but he did something about it. He gave. You know what the epitome of love is? Giving. Here's, again, my marriage, and I'm hoping and praying everybody else's marriage in here today is this. You know what makes my marriage so successful? Number one, it's Jesus first in our marriage. So that's the number one. What is the word I'm looking for? Ingredient in, in your recipe. But giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. He's saying, listen, I'm not just saying I love you. I, I, this isn't just words. I'm not just writing this down in a book and giving it to you to read for all of eternity he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us he gave he gave his life for you he gave his life for me by the way, guys, there's been no greater love ever demonstrated than the love of God that he has for us, that he gave his only begotten son. And you're here today, you feel like you're unlovable. Can I tell you something this morning? I used to feel that way. I felt I was unlovable. There's nobody on this planet that can love me until I met the one who loved me. So I was introduced to the one who loved me, and his name is Jesus. And then from that moment on, I knew this not only can I be loved but I can also love guys you know why I love you it's because he first loved me it's easy to love you guys most of you I'm kidding 100% of you I love my church guys I brag on my church all the time I almost feel guilty for bragging on my church but that's what I should be doing as your pastor but I love you. And you know my desire for each and every one of you is that you love one another. This is how all men will know that you are my disciples. Not by your works, not by your spiritual gifts, not by your eloquence, not by how much scripture you know, by the love that you have for one another. Guys, this world needs to be loved. It needs to know who loves them. You want to change culture and society? You want murder rates to go down? You want, you want lies to stop? You want coveting to stop? You want, guys, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love one another as yourselves. Now, is all that stuff going to go away? No. But you know what Paul said? One day prophecies will end. Tongues will cease. Some of these gifts will go away. But one thing that will not ever go away is God's love for us church it's time for us to start loving 
you know, but I know, again, it's easy to get caught up in whatever's going on in our world, and I can't love this person, I can't love that person because they wait, the way they treated our former president and the way they did this and the way they did that. You know why they're treating them that way, guys? They are lost. They need a Savior. You know why I acted the way I acted? I was lost. I needed a Savior. And once I found that Savior, guess what? My life has never been the same. And I promise you this, guys, if we start loving and our community sees it, they'll notice. They'll say, man, what is going on at First Baptist Church of Trenton? Man, them people are walking out on Sundays, and they're smiling all the time. And, and listen, we're hearing them say, we love you, brother, we love you, sister, and praying for you, and this, that, and the other. And they're hanging out and, and during the course of the week, and it's not just Sunday. They're hearing you at your workplace, you know. Do you think that would make a difference, guys? Why do you think Paul addressed it? Because he knew how important it was. And so as we pray this morning, here's what I want us all to do. Before we do anything else, I want us to pray like this. God, if there's somebody in my life right now that I'm finding hard to love, God, help me today to love that person. God, help me today. Help me today to overcome the resentfulness and, and the, the grudge that I'm holding and just help me today, Lord, to love that person. It could be anybody. But you know and God knows who that person is. And then when God reveals it, won't you do this? You want to be free today? So you know what? I'm not going to let that person control me anymore. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to hold grudges. I'm not going to be resentful. The next time I see that person, I'm going to be cordial. I'm going to let them know I love them and I'm praying for them. You think that'll make a difference in their life? The three most powerful words, I love you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. As the praise team makes their way up, and as you're praying right now. Maybe there is somebody in your life today that's they're just hard to love. And as I say that, I want you to know this, guys. I'm not saying that you love their behavior. I'm not saying that you love the act that was committed against you. I'm telling you that you love them in spite of that. That you see them the way that Christ sees them. That we no longer look at them through our lens, but we look at them through the lens of Christ. As I think about that Roman soldier that said, truly, truly, this was the Son of God. He knew that Jesus loved him. And I'm convinced that Jesus, even on that cross, when those nails were being put in his hands and his feet, he was letting them know, I still love you. I'm doing this for you. You see, Jesus died for you. There's nobody that loves you that much that will give his life so that you can have eternal life. And all we have to do is, by faith, believe that he is the Son of God that he took the place of our sins and our punishment. He took the penalty for our sin. He, was, he died on the cross. He was buried, and he rose again three days later. By faith, believe that. Cry out to him as a sinner today. Ask him to save you. And listen, if you've never done that today, if you've never cried out to Jesus, if you've never asked him, if you've never said, Lord, please forgive me of my sin, I believe that you died on the cross, that you were buried, you rose again three days later. By faith, I believe that. I'm crying out to you to be my Savior today. And if you've never done that, number one, I want to pray for you right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, would you just slip up your hand right now? Pastor Tim, I'm not saved. I've never asked Jesus to forgive me my sins. I've never made him my Savior. Would you pray for me right now? Anybody here today? And then, child of God, listen, I want to pray for you. You don't have to raise your hand. 
But listen, who is that person that God put on your heart? That you're just having a hard time of loving? Listen, won't you come to this altar today and pray for that person? Won't you come and just lift up that person to Jesus today? And not just that person, but lift yourself up to Christ today. And say, Lord, I can't do this by myself. I need your help. And just watch the freedom that takes place in your life. And then you take that next step. And you go to that person. And you let them know that you love them. That you've forgiven them. Or maybe you're here today and you've got another need. Maybe again it's spiritual or physical or emotional, financial. Listen, I want to pray for you today. And if I can do that, you come as we sing the song of invitation. Heavenly Father, we come to you humbled. Father, it's so hard to comprehend truly how much you love us. But Father, as that great theologian, Karl Barth, said one time, that again, all theology in the world can be wrapped up in one simple phrase. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And Father, we thank you for your word today that shows us your love for us. And so, Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would move in our midst today. Father, for us as believers, that there's somebody in our lives that we're holding a grudge against, that we have not forgiven. Father, help us today, start today, to forgive that person, to pray for that person, and tell that person that we love them. So, Father, have your will and your way today. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand with me if you would.